So now that all that's done, let's pray and let's dive into the service today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so incredibly grateful for today. We're grateful for your love in our lives. And Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would encourage us and challenge us as we look at your word and that, Father, and, and help us to respond accordingly. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, so I was thinking about uh, being on mission. Every time we come in through the walls of this church, you know, we have a mission to complete. And I was thinking about missions outside the walls, too. And I was thinking about all the times in my life uh, when I was on mission outside the walls of a building. And uh, one story dawned on me that I haven't told in a very long time, uh, and that is when I was in college. Uh, I was in Springfield, Missouri, going to a Baptist Bible college, and my wife was still back home at Youngstown, Ohio, and so we were dating. We weren't engaged yet, but we were almost engaged, and um, I was apart from her for years before we got married our, my, my senior year, and um, uh, I worked at a, tele- a telemarketing company called Zaxxon, and Zaxxon, uh, I sold like BP cards and Discover cards all over the phone, and it was just crazy. So anyway, there was a girl uh, that worked with me. She, she was in the next row of cubicles, about four behind me. I don't remember her name. I promise you I don't. Uh, I think her name was Laura, but I have no clue, actually. Uh, but she was uh, uh, blonde, very pretty, very cute, very flirty, and I'm telling you that because I never noticed any of those things uh, until when what I'm about to tell you what happened. So what ended up happening was this girl was there and, and she was just a friend. And, and I remember going into the uh, lunch room and uh, uh, she said, hey, I, I need to make you, uh, I should make you lunch tomorrow. And I thought, oh, cool. That sounds good to me. You know, I haven't had a home cooked meal in a long time, right? And then, then I show up to work the next day and she goes, hey, for lunch, she goes, uh, why don't you come home with me to my apartment for lunch? And I was like, I was like, oh, sure. Okay, great. I was like, great. And I remember, like, looking back at it, like, I looked like she was, like, so cute and giddy. And I shouldn't say cute. Sorry. I, I didn't mean that. Honey, where are you at? So I, what I meant to say was she was going, she was, she was trying, to, trying to be cute. And she was going, hee, 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 hee. And she was doing all these things. And I was like, I was like why is she acting that way? And so, so I didn't think anything of it, I promise you. So we end up getting in the car, go five minutes to her, house, to her apartment. We, we get out, we go over there, and she drops her stuff, and she turns around and, to try to kiss me. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? I had no clue. I was so naive. And she goes, why did you think I asked you over for lunch? And I was like, well, apparently I don't know. I'm like, I had no idea. Now listen, there, there's a verse in Galatians that says, to the pure, all things are pure. Now listen, I know it sounds totally self-righteous to put that on yourself. Like I normally would never say that about myself. It sounds like a self-righteous brag. But I think in some cases, it's okay to to brag in in this way. Because I promise you, I was clueless. I did not look at her that way at all. So so apparently she she tries this and she's like, like, why? I said, I don't know, I don't know. So we start talking and she's like, fine. She's like, just grab your stuff. Let's go. Grab your coat. Let's go. And she, she starts to huff and go out. And I said, what about lunch? And she goes, what do you mean? She, and I'm like, what about lunch? You promised me lunch. And I was serious. And she goes, well, I don't have anything in the whole apartment. And I said, what do you have? And she goes, I have cheese Whiz and crackers. I said, I love cheese Whiz and crackers. And she's like, are you serious right now? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, come on, just because this was weird. And she goes, listen, I'm embarrassed. She goes, and this is awkward. And she goes, and how could you just sit there and act like it's not awkward? I said, no, 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 no. I said, listen, I'm sorry. I said, this is on me. I'm the one that misread all the signals. I said, I said, this isn't on you at all. I said, I'm just in my own little bubble, I guess, right? I said, this is on me. I said, you, you shouldn't feel weird at all. Come on, let's sit down. So I got the cheese whiz out and I started doing cheese whiz and crackers. All of a sudden, it was just turned into a normal conversation. I was asking her about her childhood and everything else, and she's like, this is weird. So she took me back, and then that was on a Friday. Then on a Monday, I went back, and, and she actually was in the break room, and I went up, and I sat next to her because she was there by herself. And she goes, how are you not acting like this is awkward? And I said, because it's not, man. I said, this is just a normal thing. You know, don't worry about it. And she goes, you're, you know, this is amazing. She goes, you're just unlike anybody I've ever met. And I said, well, she's like, how can you do that? And I said, well, you know why, right? She said, why? I said, because I'm a Christian. She's like, I don't even know what that is. So in the break room, I led her to Christ. And so she, she accepts Christ and she becomes, yeah, it was really cool. And so then, 
Then we became like, she was a friend to our friend group. And then I remember when my car broke down for like three weeks, she lent me her car. I was driving around college with her car. And my buddy Norm's like, wasn't that the cheese whiz girl? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, he's like, how do you have her car? How did you make that not weird? I said, I led her to Christ. And because, <laughs> because it's like, that was just, you know, it was just amazing. Now, I don't remember her name. I promise you I don't. But at the time, I just, I just couldn't help, you know, for that to come out of me. Hey, because I'm a Christian. And I could have easily just been distracted trying to navigate the situation. But I was just on mission, just, you know, telling her about Jesus. Now, here's the, here's the question. The question is this. So if you and I are supposed to be that way, we're supposed to be on mission outside the walls of these church because that's where most of our lives are spent. The question is, why don't I have a cheese whiz type story like at least once a week or if not twice a week? That's a good question, isn't it? right? And it's not a shame on you question, but it is a question. And I think that the answer is clear. It's because our lives are busy and they're complicated. And I think the answer is because it's easy to forget the mission that we're supposed to be on. I think it's just easy to forget. And again, I just believe this. I believe that one of the things that we could take away from today is if you and I are not careful, we can miss opportunities that'll pass us by, that'll be life-changing for both us and others when we just ignore the mission that God has called us on. And we also have no idea what's at stake every single time that you and I decide to do just the smallest effort to be part of the mission that God calls us on, you and I have no idea what's at stake or the difference that we will make for eternity just by being a little bit aware to what God asks us to do. Okay, so that sets forth, that one scene sets forth the mission. And the mission is they're going to go for the next two and a half hours across the galaxy and they're going to battle hundreds of people against all odds. And they're going to risk their lives and they're going to risk everything. And they're going to come up against a villain that is seemingly unbeatable and somehow they find a way to beat him. Sorry, spoiler, they win, guess what? But they, they, they somehow beat him and they do countless, you know, things, you know, just, I mean, just unbelievable effort. And they do all of it for the life of one person, right? In other words, they put their lives on the line for the risk of one soul, one single soul. And by the way, if you haven't figured it out by now, that's the whole gospel. That's the gospel, which is why it's interesting because I believe that the gospel story is woven in all of us and all of us want to be rescued. All of us have a need to be delivered or to see the person, you know, saved or rescued. All of us have something inside of us that want us to connect to that, which by the way, John Rupert wrote a book and talked about the top 100 grossing films of all time and said the top 100 grossing films of all time follow the same pattern. Everything was right in the world. And then something happens that messes everything up. There's a problem. And then there's either a battle that needs to happen or a journey that needs to be taken. Somebody needs to be rescued. And then everything's right in the end. Now, not all good movies follow that pattern. But guess what? Out of the top grossing movies, which means the ones that we put all of our money toward, out of the top 100 grossing films, guess how many have that pattern? All 100. Which means that there's something inside your soul and something inside my soul that longs for it. And I would argue that that is the gospel story placed in you. And so even though, though the movie is not spiritual in itself, it connects to that part of us that is spiritual. And we, we, we relate to it. Because it's not on the screen, but what does the Bible say? John 15, 13. That greater love has no one than this, that when a man lays down his life for his friends. And so this one thing sets the mission. And by the way, it reminds me of a story in the Bible. So there was a guy named Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, and he's partnering with a guy named Silas, and they were in a church called Philippi, or a, 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 a town called Philippi. They started a church in Philippi. And, and actually, what they were doing there is they were going to preach the gospel. They were telling people about Jesus. That's what the word gospel means. It means good news. And they were, they were just trying to tell everybody about Jesus. Well, there was a woman, the Bible says there, that was actually had a demon. She was possessed with a demon. But she also had the gift of telling the future. And so there was a lot of people making a lot of money off of this girl because they were like her, you know, her, her masters and they were actually using her to, to charge people money to tell them about the future. And what ended up happening was Paul and Silas are walking through the village. This girl is harassing the disciples and screaming to the crowd, these men have come to tell you about the most high, excuse me. And it says that Paul stops and turns around and says to the woman, you know, demon come out of her and, and all of a sudden she's healed. Well, the ones who, you know, leveraged her gift for money uh, her gift for money, uh, were very upset, obviously. So they, they got a mob of people to go against Paul and Silas. And that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 16. Look at verse number 22. 
It says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and, uh, and the city officials ordered them to be stripped and beaten with wooden rods, and they were severely beaten. And if the Bible says severely, you better believe it is. And then they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks, which, by the way, was not just secure, but also torturous. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were cussing. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it seemingly, you know, that's probably what it could be for a lot of us. They were screaming, they were yelling, they were angry at God. No, 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 no. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And then the other prisoners were listening. The Bible goes out of its way to say that detail because we're going to figure out why it does. But apparently they got everybody's attention. I don't know who sings and sings hymns when they're tortured, but apparently these guys do. Verse number 26. Suddenly, I love that word suddenly. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner, not just Paul and Silas, but every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open and he assumed that the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself because he knows that you know, his officials are going to kill him anyway. So he might as well do it himself swiftly. And then Paul shouted to him, stop. Don't kill yourself. We are all here, which means everybody stayed behind. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so what's amazing is, that, is and honestly, the most amazing thing to me is not just Paul, but Paul and everybody else. These guys who, you know, they, they weren't on mission with Paul. But think about it. If you're in the prison and you're a criminal, you're a legitimate criminal, and, and you hear guys singing and praising, you're like, that's not normal. And then while they're singing and praising, all of a sudden the earthquake happens. You're like, God's on their side, and your chains fell off, your door flies open, and you're thinking, I'm going to run to escape. But then Paul says, no, 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 no. We're all here. Don't kill yourself. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, whatever this guy says, I'm with him, right? I'm just, I don't know what this is, but I'm with him. Because something supernatural is going to happen. and Whatever it is, I'm with this guy. So Paul basically sacrifices his own freedom and his own life, risking his very life. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He's risking everything. See, Paul had every reason to believe that God was delivering them out of prison, that, that his job was to run. But his job wasn't to run first. First and foremost, his job, his calling, his mission was to reach those who are far from God. And I can't even imagine somebody further from God in this story than a Roman soldier whose job was to torture for a living. And so this man's soul was more important than himself, than his own freedom, than the freedom of everybody. And he says, don't do yourself any harm. Don't kill yourself, for we're all here. And the jailer, of course, overwhelmed by concern. Why would Paul ever be concerned for him? And so, of course, he falls down and says, what must I do to follow your God? Whatever you believe, I want to believe. Whatever you have, I want. And let me ask you a question. Maybe you feel like the jailer here today. Maybe the jailer, if you were to ask him, and perhaps one day we will, the jailer could say, like, I'm not worth what you're giving me here. I'm not worth you staying behind. Do you know what I've done? Do you know my history? Do you know my past? I'm not worth this. To which Paul would say, yes, you are. And maybe you're here today and you're like, Chris, you have no idea what I've done. You have no idea. I, I, don't, I, I feel unworthy even to walk in through the doors of a church. And, and, and you don't know my thought life. You don't know my actions and the consequences of them. And I'm not worth it. To which God would say, yes, you are. Because God sent his only son into the world to die on a cross for you. And if you were the only one, he would have done the same. Because God thinks you're worth it. God looks beyond our sin and sees our heart. Just like Paul looked beyond the orders and the atrocities of the man that he supposedly had every reason to hate. And yet says, says don't do yourself any harm because you are worth it. You see... I mentioned a minute ago that I had led the girl, you know, to Christ in the break room, and I had mentioned just now that Paul led to Christ this jailer and everybody in his household, and they were baptized. So what did he tell them? Maybe, you're, maybe you 
you know, possibly in the future, maybe you find yourself in a situation where you have to tell somebody about God, and you're like, you know, you find yourself in a cheese whiz situation, you know, or a break room situation, rather, or maybe you find yourself in a jailer situation where somebody says, what must I do to be saved? And you're like, I have no idea what to say. Paul probably said something similar to this. It's only one verse. It's the most popular verse in all the Bible. John chapter 3, verse 16, and it reads this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And by the way, people always ask two questions concerning heaven. What do I need to know to get to heaven? And what do I need to do to get to heaven? And they're all found in this one verse. In fact, there's only two words per question and here here they are. I've highlighted them for you. It says, for God so loved that he gave. That's the only thing you need to know. You don't need to know anything at all about the Bible other than the fact that God sent Jesus and he gave his only son because he loves you and me. God loved, God gave. And then it says, what do you need to do to get to heaven? What do you need to do? Well, it's simple. You need to believe and then you'll have eternal life. That's it. The Bible says faith, you know, salvation comes through faith, Ephesians 2 says right? And so if you want to get cute with it, instead of saying believe and have, you can say you believe and then you receive. What do you need to do? Need to know? God loved, God gave. What do you need to do? Believe and receive. That is it. And so this is primarily the message of the gospel. This is the story of Jesus. This is what Paul was sharing with the jailer. This is what I shared with the woman in the break room. So I want you to know that when God sent his only son into the world, it was driven by love. And what did Jesus do? Sacrificed himself on the cross for you. I'm laughing at myself because I'm such a sucker. I'm like, I'm so emotional just watching that <laughs> little clip. I have no idea whether you're just like, how could you ever? Uh, that's fine. I just, I totally believe, I'm bought in. I'm totally bought in. And, uh, and listen, even if, even if you don't, you know, necessarily care for science fiction, I think the emotion in the message is really crystal clear. And so here we have somebody who will literally stop at nothing. And that's kind of how you feel when you walk out of the theater or whether you rent it at home. You, you walk away from the movie and you say, here's a group of people that will literally stop at nothing and they risk everything all for one? Are you kidding me? And that's the message of the gospel. That's the mission of the church. In fact, it also reminds me of what Paul said later on in his life when he was writing back to a church called Corinth. And one of my favorite passages that Paul writes is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and it reads this way, or, or excuse me, chapter 9, verse 19. Paul says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. He's talking about leading people to Christ. He says, To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like like one under the law, although I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. Then he says, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. I want you to know that Paul is my hero and my example. Outside of Jesus Christ, it's Paul who inspires me because he says, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And you know what it means to be a Jew? I know how Jews act. I know how Hasidic Jews and, re- and restrict, you know, Pharisaical Jews, I know how they act because I am one. And so I'll act like them. I'll build my common ground. I will resonate. I will speak their language all for the one purpose. I'll do all that to win them to Jesus Christ. And to those who are not under the law, in other words, Gentiles, those outside the Jewish religion, man, I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. I know what it's like to be around Roman citizens. I could act that way too. And I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do what Whatever I can to resonate, build influence, leverage my influence with them, and I'm going to lead them to Christ. To the weak, I become weak. To the strong, I'm strong. And, and he goes on and on, and he says, I do all of it. And I, I, I become all things to all people so that by any possible means, I may win just some. Because this is my mission. And I want you to know that this next statement that I'm about to give you summarizes my entire life. And this is what I'm about more than anything else in my career, which is a pretty big statement. And here it is. 
we will always do everything we can to reach everyone we can. That's it. That's what our services are about. We will always do anything we can to reach everyone that we can, right? We'll do everything. Uh, everything short of sin. <laughs> We're not going to do the sin part, right? But we'll, we'll consider anything. We'll consider any method, any strategy, right? To try to capture people's attention long enough so that we can capture their hearts for God. Like, for instance, I'll even use a goofy example. Like, even today, you walk in, there was 10 minutes of worship, and then we had four minutes of, of goofy, awesome 70s mix medley, right? And for those of us who are Christians, who think that everything should be content, and, and that was too, you know, fluff, and that wasn't for me, you'd say, well, that's 10 minutes of worship, four minutes of a fun song, why can't we have 14 minutes of worship? I would just say, well, that four minutes wasn't for you. It was for the person who came in through the door that doesn't necessarily resonate with church yet. It was for the person, it was to capture people's attention long enough, right? Not to mention, God tells us to have fun. Jesus laughed, by the way. He, he did all kinds of things, right? And so we're allowed to, we're, we're allowed to have a, 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 a tapestry of emotions the way that God created us, all, as long as we point it all back to Jesus Christ. And so, listen, I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing everything I can to win anyone that I can. And I'll use any means necessary because that's what Paul says, and so we're going to be on mission together. 